glad that you are here to worship with us this morning on this beautiful summer-like morning after we thought it might never actually arrive. A special warm welcome to our guests today. We're really grateful that you are here. It's so nice to look out and see more and more different faces who haven't been coming back into the sanctuary, coming to join us. We're really grateful. And to our friends on Zoom, we're glad you're here as well. Please take a moment to uh, type your prayer concerns into the chat. So before Sue comes in, I just have a quick uh, announcement for you. If you didn't see it in the good news, we are collecting money for a gift for Sue's ordination, which will be, if she is approved for that, uh, for her call here in three weeks from today. We're looking to raise about $400 to buy her a special stole and communion kit. Uh, Sandy Ewell and... Um, and over our handling that, you can put your money into the offering plate. Just note on your gift that it is for that. So she's going to be in in a minute, so we'll end that. But just be sure to give that uh, within the next couple of weeks if you could. And we do have a congregational meeting immediately following worship today, both for people on Zoom and for those of you who are here in the sanctuary the meeting should be very short it will only take a few minutes so i hope that you will all stay with us as the one item on our agenda is to vote to call sue to be our associate pastor um, there will be another meeting following that one, which I hope will also be quite short. So please stick around because we're going to be talking about mission trips for the summer. After a couple of years of not being able to travel, we're hoping to do not one but two mission trips this summer. Our usual week trip to Lots Creek and then a shorter weekend trip, a little three-day Friday through Sunday trip to the Dayton area to help with uh, disaster recovery after the tornado damage that happened there three years ago. We would love to have you join us and coming to the meeting is just a chance to learn some information. You are not going to be asked to make a commitment, although I will ask about your intention so that we can kind of get a count, a tentative count, and we're going to try to look at dates that work for folks. So please stick around for that. We have a really important Allies for Justice meeting on Thursday. It will begin in Fellowship Hall with dinner at 6, and then from 6.30 to 8, we'll ha we will have a workshop with someone from Greater Cleveland Congregations who will share with us ways that we can get involved and make a difference in our work for justice as part of that wonderful organization. Please join us. There is a sign-up uh, genius in your good news but come even if you haven't signed up because signing up just helps us know about how many people to prepare for with regard to food but we'd love to have you there in any case the follow-up to that workshop will be on thursday june 2nd and it's great if you can be at both of them we are collecting bikes as we did back in 2015. For those of you who've been here for a little while, you remember when we collected 75 bikes for the refugee children from the Congolese and Somalian communities. Our new partnership with Joseph House is now looking to collect bikes for children in their circle. These are also refugee children, and we would like to receive those by Thursday. They can be any size, although smaller bikes are the most in need, and they can be dropped off at church any time this week between 10 and 3. We'd love to receive some bikes. So if you go by a garage sale or maybe today uh, or maybe this week if someone has one on their tree lawn for the trash, snatch it up and bring it to church. Workship is coming up on May 29th, and Carolyn Jenny has been doing a great job of putting together our projects for that day. Our list is a little shorter than normal because it is a holiday week, and we do know that attendance will be down, but we would love to have you participate in one of the projects that we have available. Please see Carolyn at the tables in the lobby as you leave this morning, um, or sign up on Sign Up Genius. It will be really helpful for us to know how many people to expect. 
We're also looking for volunteers for our garden. You know, every time I come to church, I just marvel at how beautiful our landscaping looks, thanks in large part to a very small team of people. Paul King, Sandy, and George Yule are carrying the lion's share of this work. But it needs some help. It needs participation for more of us. So if you could spare a few hours, even if it's just one time, preferably if it could be maybe once a week or once every couple of weeks, please let Sandy or George, or excuse me, Sandy or Paul know so that they can assign you a section and give you some ideas of what needs to be done. We'd really appreciate your help. It's hard to believe that the school year is coming to an end, but graduation will be coming up in the next couple of weeks, and we will be recognizing our graduates on June 12th. If you or someone you know is graduating, please let Judy Hammer know as soon as possible so we can include them in our celebration. And I just wanna give you a little heads up. Watch your good news this week for information about another shower that we're going to have. Many of you remember um, a summer ago or two summers ago when we collected items for, uh, for Rita. We're going to be collecting items on June 12th for Edna's House, one of our newer ministry partners. You've been hearing, if you remember when Sarah Murphy was here a couple of months ago, she shared the project that they've been engaging to create longer-term housing for folks who need to remain in their program a little longer. And they're just about to dedicate that space. They need some household items for those ladies. They are going to be providing us with a registry this week at both Target and Walmart. And I will have that for you in the good news on Thursday. Please be sure to take a look, purchase a gift as you are able, and then bring them to church no later than June 12th when we will shower them with all of our commitment to helping them. And now, my friends, we continue our exploration of our money stories this month, listening for the new narrative that God is speaking into the limited one that we have told ourselves. Scripture calls us to reimagine a world where our social and economic systems are not built to disparage or impoverish, but rather instead to provide for and benefit all. This week we revisit the story of the widow's might, a scripture that begs for reimagination and reinterpretation from the harmful ways that it has been used. Instead of commending the widow's giving practices, perhaps Jesus is condemning the economic system that created her poverty. The Jewish practice of the Jubilee year invites us to imagine leaving at the edges of the harvest food for the poor and the immigrants to reap. And in the 50th year, the harvest is shared and disparities are rebalanced. In light of these stories in scripture, how are we called to reimagine our own money stories?
Please rise in body or spirit for the call to worship. Can you imagine unfettered love, free and bold, wild and true, the kind of love that changes you? Can you imagine a home, safe and bright, with impromptu dancing, meals around the table, and laughter late into the night? Can you imagine faith like a compass that guides the way you shop and vote, the way you love and hope, that asks questions and yet still believes, even despite uncertainty? Can you imagine a world where trees, bees, and all living things grow wild and free? Where peace is the narrative and hope the currency? A world where news stories are testimonies and funerals are far between. Can you imagine? Today in worship, dare to dream. Dare to imagine what could be and pay attention for God is here in wandering thoughts, hopes, and prayers. Let us worship holy God that, that, that great unfettered, unfettered love We always seem to notice the rich and powerful, thinking those are the people we should emulate. But we find God in those who are broken, those who sacrifice, and those who care deeply for others. Join me as we confess how we have noticed the wrong people and longed for the wrong values. God of grace, you invite us to dream of a better world but instead we bury our heads in the sand, afraid to recognize how much must change. We are afraid because if we know the truth, we need to do something about it. So instead, more often than not, we maintain the status quo, passively allowing things to remain the same. We don't speak out 
or dare to dream of a world without racism, sexism, bigotry, or shame. Instead, we allow ourselves to believe that some things will never change. Forgive us, show us the way, teach us to dream and reimagine a new way. Humbly we pray. Amen. Despite our foolishness and poor choices, God remains faithful in each and every moment. The one who created everything continues to renew us, to restore us, and forgive us with love. God's hope never fails us. God's grace continues to fill our emptiness, and God's mercy continues to make us new. Thanks be to God. Amen. for all of the children to come up and join me on the steps and you know today I really need that great big group of kids who were here last week so if some of you bigger kids want to come up and join me I'll tell you that there are treats in it for you and I could really use a few more people to make this children's message work if anyone else wants to come on up good morning girls how are you oh my goodness oh that's right you had surgery this week didn't you Kai how are you doing good hey Teddy Good morning, Mom and Dad. No other kids who want to come up? I'm guessing that we have more kids out there than this. Bigger kids, no? Hmm, thank you, Sandy. All right, thank you, Patty. Oh, look at the choir's good, 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 good. I love it, I love it. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So let me go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Just had to be a little prepared. There we go. So this morning, I want to talk about offering. Have any of you ever given any money in the offering for Sunday school or here in the church? Some of you have? Yeah. And when you put that money in the offering plate, where does it come from? Where do you get money from to put in the offering plate, Kaya? From your parents? <laughs> does anybody have a job or get an allowance? I have a job. All right. Ben has an important job. All right. That's where Ben gets his money from. How many of you have to buy your own food? Kinsley, do you have to buy your own food? Your parents do? You are really lucky. Do you have to pay your Netflix bill or the cell phone or anything like that? No? Well, how about if you need mom and dad to drive you somewhere? Teddy, do you have to give mom and dad gas money to take you to church or anywhere else you need to go? <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> you guys have it pretty good. <laughs> well, today's Bible story is about a woman who didn't have a lot of money. And she didn't have any family to take care of her either. Some people took advantage of her and asked her to put every last penny that she had in the offering plate. And she did. She gave absolutely everything she had. Now, some people had more money than she did, but they only gave a little bit of all the money that they had. And even though it was more than she put in, it wasn't as big of a deal as her putting her last coins in. Does that make sense? Jesus noticed the woman in the story, and it made him sad to see that she gave up so much more than everyone else did. 
for some people, that penny isn't really a whole lot, like that very rich man that we talked about last week. I wonder if you could imagine another way for this story to happen. I have an idea. I have a way to show you. <clears throat> so everyone take one of these little pieces of paper out of the bowl and pass it down your way and then we'll pass it back and go the other way. And you can look at what it says on your paper. And Teddy can have one too. There we go. He probably needs a little help with reading it, I'm going to guess but maybe he's that good. There you go, everybody take one. So, Kinsley, what does yours say? Rich person, Rich person? okay. Um, hold on here, I gotta find my right ones. Here you go, rich person. Kaya, what does yours say? Um, peasant. peasant, okay, Miss Peasant. There we go, Ben, what do you have? widow okay Deborah what do you have peasant. peasant can you pass those down to Deborah please and Teddy what do you have rich person. oh Teddy <laughs> you are so lucky you little rich guy can you pass that down to Teddy Sandy how about you widow, widow. okay and um, Wes peasant and Patty a peasant see there are more peasants than there are anything in Jesus's day there are a couple of rich people but more peasants and a couple of widows so rich people how many cookies do you have in your bag five cookies how many do you have Kai uh, Kinsley five how many peasants how many do you get two, two. who were our widows Ben and Sandy, how many cookies did you get? None. How are you feeling, guys? You little widows. Hungry. <laughs> it's kind of, it's, <laughs> Teddy's loving this. It's kind of sad, isn't it? Do you think that's very fair? What do you think, Kinsley? Does that feel fair? You got five cookies. Still doesn't feel fair? Oh, how are you feeling with Ben sitting right next to you with nothing? Feel bad. <laughs> yeah, feel bad. How, are, how about you, Sandy? How are you feeling over there with nothing? Jealous. Jealous, yeah. Well, I wonder if we might be able to rectify that a little bit. Now, I don't have five cookies, but those of you who do, maybe with a napkin, would decide to share them with somebody else. Oh, I have a bag of five cookies, Sandy. You can have the five cookies. And you know what, Ben? We'll kind of leave you in the middle. We'll give you two bags of peasant cookies, so you'll get four. Yeah. So I wonder if just like we made sure that everyone had something, what it might feel like if more people did the same thing for that widow. What if people didn't take advantage of her and instead helped her out or made sure she had enough? Do you think that might be a little bit better way to handle things? So every time you put money in the offering plate, I hope that you will remember the woman who gave her very last penny. And think about how God might reimagine a world where everyone has enough. Uh-oh, giving the kid cookies and not letting them eat them right away is not a good thing. He could probably have one. It's okay, Mom. <laughs> can we pray together? Will you repeat after me nice and loud so everyone can hear you? Dear God, thank you for taking care of us. Help us imagine a world where everyone is taken care of and no one has to give up their last penny or their last Oreo. Amen. Thank you, big children, for coming up and helping us. Thank you, younger children, for being here. You may go and help out. You get to keep the cookies. You can enjoy those. And if there's someone you need to share with, you could um, do that when you get to class. Just use a napkin to do that, okay? Thanks. <laughs> Would you please join me in the prayer for illumination? Holy God, we want to see what you see, but we stumble through roadblocks of bias and narrow perspective 
fear, and limited information. We are too small to imagine the type of love and beauty you can sow. So in this moment, we ask you to clear the obstacles that keep us from you. Blow the dust out of our ears and thaw out the frozen parts of our hearts. Tell the logical arguments we form about what will and will not work to take a back seat. And as you do, breathe fresh air into our lungs and fill our minds with endless possibilities. We want to see what you see. We want to reimagine this life we're living. Amen. The book of Leviticus, often misappropriated, contains commandments that the ancient Israelites believed were to be followed to honor God's holiness. Our passages this morning come from a section of the book referred to as the Holiness Code, a section whose scope is to include all of the promised land. The passages we read this morning are particularly concerned with the importance of seeking justice and serving others. Hear these words from the commandments of Leviticus. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. You shall count off seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the period of seven weeks of years gives 49 years. Then you shall have the trumpet sounded loud on the 10th day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement, you shall have the trumpet sounded throughout all your land. And you shall hallow the 50th year and you shall proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. You shall return, every one of you, to your property and every one of you to your family. That 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. You shall not sow or reap the aftergrowth or harvest the unpruned vines, for it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You shall eat only what the field itself produces. God is still speaking. Our gospel reading this morning occurs during Jesus' days in Jerusalem in his last week of life. Conflict had been brewing between Jesus and the temple authorities, with his interrogators questioning Jesus on a number of topics. In this section of the 12th chapter, he now takes the initiative. Watch this contemporary retelling of Jesus' indictment of the scribes and his story about a poor widow.
Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts be acceptable to you this day, O God, our rock and our redeemer. The story of the widow's might is one we all know so well. We've heard it preached at stewardship time over and over. But this week, one of my favorite commentators, Pastor David Lose, asked a really interesting question about this story. He posited, is Jesus' description of the poor widow's offering praise or lament? Now, I'm sure, like me, you've heard this story preached countless times as a story to inspire us to give like she did, all she had. If this poor widow could give her last two pennies, then couldn't all of us give a little bit more? But Lois's question got me thinking. Is this a story of praise or lament? If we read this passage very carefully, we realize that Jesus has been criticizing the temple leaders ever since he arrived in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday at the beginning of the week when this story happens in the middle of that same week. And the verses immediately preceding this story of the widow offer the scathing critique of the scribes, how they expect respect in places of honor. And then Jesus says, they devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearances say long prayers. Actually, there's nowhere in this text that Jesus praises the widow. There's no indication that he's holding her up as an example for us. He simply describes what she does. She puts two copper coins in the offering plate. I don't know about you, but I so wish that I could hear Jesus' tone of voice as he tells this story. Is he heartbroken or outraged? Is he resigned or sad? I've realized that despite how many times we have heard this story preached over at least my whole life, the story is actually more about condemnation than about commendation. It really doesn't offer us a good example because who among us would actually be willing to put the last of everything we had in the world into the offering plate? Her giving puts us all to shame. I think here Jesus is challenging the temple leaders to be more just. Throughout this week, as I've reflected on this story, it has haunted me more and more. Jesus is decrying the circumstances that demanded that she make an offering of everything she had to live on. It's left me wanting to know more about this woman. What was her name? How long has she been widowed? What drove her to have such a deep faith? What made her so incredibly brave? I want to sit down with her and hear her story and give her a hug. I want to hear how she managed to swallow her panic and desperation and instead face the end of her life with hope and dignity. And I really want to let her know how much I love her subversive act of defiance and her refusal to be dehumanized. She gave her whole life and likely died shortly after placing those coins in the offering plate. Yes, she likely died because she had no one else to care for her. 
no one to give her food or protection, and she now had no money left to care for herself. I realized as I thought about this story that Jesus was killed about four days after this story took place, and that this widow probably died right about that very same time herself. When you think of it that way, doesn't it make you wonder why would we have ever held her up and applauded her generosity? I think it's in part because we really don't want to see her, do we? She's just too vulnerable. We are so terrified that she could be us. And so we turn and look away. It's what we do with vulnerable people, isn't it? In our fear of being like them, we tend to ignore and judge them. Think of those people that you see at the end of the freeway exit ramps. How many of you dare to look them in the eye? Jesus sees her, cares about her sacrifice, and there I was able to find some good news in this story because God sees her and cares about her and calls us to do the same. To see all of the widows, all of the vulnerable people, and care about them. To stand with them. To stand against laws that exploit them. To vote for people who enact policies that will bring protection and change our culture of working against them. Once we stop and see the story in this way, doesn't it make you wonder how in the world we ever miss this point that Jesus was making? As we examine our money stories, we need to be willing to truly see the widows in our world to not celebrate their generosity, but rather instead to recognize our responsibility not to exploit them, to be generous so that they don't have to be, to be willing to care for them and offer them food and protection. My prayer today, my friends, is that we will hear this story as a call to hold up that woman as our reason to fight to change the narrative to resist those things in our society and even in the institution of the church that exploit those who are vulnerable. And I pray that we will have the courage, as the widow did, to resist and subvert the powers that be. May it be so. Amen. Would you please join me in the affirmation of faith? We believe in God the creator who, like a painter with a canvas, imagined creation and breathed it into being. In Jesus, who many years walked this hurting world, showed us a new way to love. We believe in the Holy Spirit who prods us and pulls us, leads us, and guides us, carries us, and loves us into new life, day after day. Dream dreams, create anew, start over, try again, live lives of hope. So, in response, together, as God's church, We dare to dream. We strive Strive to to love. love. We try to imagine a new new day. day. And And we we walk walk together together with with God's God's help. help. Amen. Amen. Our money story this morning comes to us from Carrie Mendoza. Carrie, can you just let everyone know who you are, because I know a lot of people are still getting to know you. Carrie and her husband, Carlos, 
and their children, Allie and Michael, began attending our church just before the pandemic began. And they joined in August of 2020, part of that first group of virtual member, members who joined virtually, I shouldn't say virtual members. Carrie chaired our workshop for a few times, even before she'd ever attended. And she is now a member of the work of the outreach team. Carrie and Carlos, I'm happy to say, are among the most faithful givers in our congregation. And I see people still looking for you. Carrie, stand up for just a minute so they can see you. And I'm asking Carrie to stand because she's asked me if I would share her story this morning. She's afraid that she might cry. But I have to tell you, she sent it to me yesterday and I cried through the whole thing. I've been practicing. I don't promise anything because I have to tell you, hers is one of the most powerful stories that I've ever heard. Deep breath here goes. When it comes to my money story, which I didn't even realize was a thing before Pastor Vicki called me asking me to share my experiences with you, I would sum up my story as a struggle with worry and uncertainty. To be honest, money is a great source of my anxiety. After getting married, Carlos and I struggled for many years to find financial stability. We bought our first house shortly before the real estate bubble burst and then carried an underwater mortgage, credit card balances, and lived paycheck to paycheck. We required help from my parents on more than one occasion, and the VA paid our house payment one month when we couldn't. Money was a daily concern and a constant worry. Without help, we would still be digging out from under our debt for many more years. Once Carlos and I were able to reach stable a stable financial situation, my anxiety and constant worry did not diminish. We are comfortable now. We have the things that we need and our kids are taken care of. However, our money story has taken on a different set of worries. Being the parents of a special needs child changed our story as our stable life became more expensive very quickly. Therapies, co-pays, and equipment are costly. Carlos and I constantly worry about being able to leave enough money for our son's future. And an amount great enough to ease the burden on our daughter as she will one day become his caregiver. After my husband and I are gone, we don't save for trips and retirement bucket lists for in our old age, as we once thought we would. Instead, we stockpile our money in order to leave the greatest amount we can for our kids. Money brings tre tremendous anxiety for me and still keeps me up at night, just for different reasons now than it did earlier in our marriage. When it comes to giving to the church, Carlos and I were not exactly big financial supporters of church in the past. Our giving consisted of whatever was in my purse on the random Sundays we were in attendance, a few times a year and many weeks, not at all. More recently, as my family and I have embarked on this new faith journey and consistent church attendance, we have begun giving regularly to the church. Shortly after we decided that we were going to make our church home here and really dove into growing our faith, we received a pledge card. We started our journey here to find our faith, to develop and understand our beliefs, and to embrace a real relationship with God but receiving that pledge card was a scary day for us. How could we take from the stockpile we were building for our son's needs? I prayed about it, referenced the Bible, and waited. After leaving the pledge card on the dining room table for a few weeks, we decided that just as we dove into our faith journey, we needed to dive in here too, because although it was deeply difficult, this was just one more aspect of our journey. 
We needed to put our faith in God, to put God into our money story, and to leave everything in God's hands. That was in 2020. Our bills are paid, our family is cared for, and we are still saving and stockpiling for our son's future. Money means nothing in the grand scheme of things. It's our family, our health, our experiences together, and our memories that hold all the value. Even though money has no meaning, it also means everything to my family. But it is God who holds all the chapters of my story, and faith has taught me that must also include the chapter titled, My Money Story. So what was that first leap of faith that is now growing? God has me, has my family, and God especially has my son. He will provide all we need. We give first to God, and the rest will be provided. My money anxiety is still very real, but I am now learning to trust in God, to focus on my star word given to me this year, which is prayerfulness, and to have faith that our children, Mike and Allie, are God's children, and that God will take care of them always. I called Carrie earlier this week and asked her if she would do this, and she said, I don't think I have a money story. And then she started to tell me a little bit of this. Carrie, you've blown us away. You've inspired all of us to think differently. Thank you.
you know, Bob, while we are acknowledging the gifts that people share in this church, I just want to take a moment to say to you how amazing I find it that this small group of people, small but mighty group of people, continues to make such beautiful music for us. And to Jared, who I get the privilege now, they rehearse in the sanctuary every Sunday morning, and I get to hear how he shapes them and encourages them and produces that beautiful sound. Our choir has shrunk as a result of the pandemic, like so many things, but the quality has not changed. So thanks to all of you who make that happen, and thanks, Jared, for that. We come to this time in our service this morning where we share the joys and concerns of our hearts, asking those in our community to pray with and for us. Do you have things that you, for which you need prayer this morning? Um, Athena. Absolutely. Athena thanks Carrie for sharing her story and for being willing, I couldn't hear quite hear all of it, but I think I'm capturing, you tell me if I've got it wrong, Athena, for being willing to be vulnerable and to share how much this church means and how willing she is and her family is to give so generously. Deborah. Absolutely. Deborah, if you recall, last week Ben shared that his sister was about to uh, give birth and that there was a lot of uh, anxiety and excitement about that birth. And Joseph Parker was born on Monday, but there were some complications. And so Deborah asks, celebrates the joy of the new birth, but also asks for our prayers for both mom and baby following a difficult time. Others? I have a few to share with you. First of all, I ask that you continue to hold the Van Zanti family in your prayers. You know we were praying for Dale's mom, Nancy, who had been diagnosed with cancer and was in hospice care. Nancy passed away peacefully on Thursday as the rest of the family, Dale and Judy and Kirsten, were on their way to Purdue for Zach's graduation on Friday. And I believe Dale and Zach have gone on to be with uh, Dale's dad in Iowa. I'm guessing the rest of the family will be traveling soon, Judy and Kirsten. Our prayers are with you, Judy, and with your entire family. Last week, I asked for prayers for Dan Adams as he was undergoing uh, brain surgery on Friday. He had gamma knife surgery at the Cleveland Clinic Friday. He went home the same day and is doing well. The miracles of modern medicine never cease to amaze us. We're so grateful, Dan, that you're doing well, and to Karen, who is such a great caregiver for you. We continue prayers for Connie Lewis and Tricia Cardellino who are grieving the loss of loved ones, and continue prayers for Gus Freilich, John Gemba, Jan and Dale Henninger, Les Thwaites, Bill Simpson, Craig Gordon, and Carl Lawrence as they are continuing on their journeys for health and wholeness. This morning, it is sad to pray yet again for another mass shooting in our country, for the, ten, the families of the 10 people who were killed and the three injured in a Buffalo grocery store yesterday afternoon, and our prayers for the man at 18 years old so filled with hate as to engage such a horrific act. And this week, before we begin our prayer, I just want to pause for a moment and acknowledge the unfathomable loss of one million people in this country to COVID over the past two years. On May 28, 2020, 
we've hit the mark of 100,000 deaths. On September 22nd, 2020, 200,000 people had died. By December 14th, 2020, we reached 300,000 deaths. On January 18th, 2021, we had lost 400,000 people. By February 22nd of 2021, we reached the incredible number of a half a million lost to this virus. When vaccines became available, it took a little longer, but by June 15th, 2021, 600,000 people had died. On October 1st, 2021, we reached the milestone of 700,000 dead. Just before Christmas, on December 15th, 800,000 had died. On February 4th of 2022, we reached 900,000 deaths. And this week, we sadly recognize the loss of one million innocent lives to this horrible virus. This week, as we consider the year of Jubilee referenced in the Leviticus passage that Sandy shared with us a few minutes ago, that time every 50 years when families return home for rest and Sabbath, when debts are canceled, when the harvest is shared, we take time this morning to imagine what Jubilee might look like today. Before we do, however, let's begin with a time of silence as we lift to God those joys and concerns of our hearts. I invite you to take a red bean from the bag that you were given when you entered the sanctuary this morning and clench it in your fist. And as you do, give thanks to God for all that you have, for the resources that nourish you and the love that sustains you. Let us pray. And now I invite you to take a white bean from your bag and clench it tightly in your other hand. And as you do, to pray silently for those who do not have enough, for those who hunger for food, for rest, for justice. Let us pray. And now, with a bean in each fist, clench them as we continue our prayer using the words of Sister Ruth Marlene Fox. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. 
May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. May God help us reimagine a world where care is given to those most in need and where mercy and compassion are valued over competition, achievement, and acquisition. As we pray, we dare to dream. So let us dare to make this dream a reality. With God's help, may it be so. Trusting in God's providence and care, we unclench our fists and imagine what could be as we pray in the way Jesus taught us, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The rest of your beans you can take home and collect and make in a soup. Don't try to eat them, however, as one person suggested. They might because they're dry and they're going to crack your tooth. You're going to have to soak them before you could eat them. As we receive our offering this morning, along with your financial gifts, I invite you to place your white bean into the offering plate to represent our prayers for those who do not have enough. They will be added to our mandala later this week, and I invite you to be sure to take a look at that mandala each week as it changes. It is straight ahead when you leave the sanctuary on the bulletin board just outside Fellowship Hall. Take home your red bean as a reminder to give thanks for all that we have and to remember our calling to make God's dream a reality. Recalling our need to offer support to the widows and with a faith like Carrie's, let's give generously this morning for our offering. let us dedicate our tithes and offerings. Gracious God, we have heard in scripture of a woman who gave her last coin away. 
and we wonder if the point of the story is to wonder why she had so little when others have so much, to help us see the injustice that led to her suffering. Today, for her and for every person who cannot afford to give to God and put food on the table, we offer our gifts. We pray that you use them for your good. Right what is wrong. Balance the systems of injustice. Use these gifts to build the world that we can only imagine. But you can bring forth. In hope we pray. Amen. Please join us in singing our closing hymn. As we go into the world, give with intention, welcome with extravagance, and love unconditionally as you are loved. Amen.